markets. Well, as we talked about, the U.S. economy grew at an even faster pace than expected in the third quarter, reflecting rising trends in investment and government spending. GDP rising 5.2 percent at an annualized pace. That's the fastest in nearly two years. And it comes as Morgan Stanley has released its global outlook for 2024 and 2025 on the global economy. One of the authors there, Seth Carpenter, is joining us now, Chief Global Economist at Morgan Stanley. Good to see you, Seth. Thanks for being here. Um, it's so interesting the moment we're in right now after the year that we have had, right, where economic growth defied all predictions. And now heading into 2024, how are we feeling? <laughs> it's funny you said that it's interesting. By interesting, you mean <laughs> aggravating, confusing, <laughs> wrong footing. Uh, you know, we're feeling pretty good. You mentioned the, the GDP print. <clears throat> it was a very strong quarter. I think we knew that. The revision sort of only told us what we knew before. Big number for the quarter, but the strength, some of the business investment and structures, not in equipment. Consumer spending actually a little bit softer. Inve uh, inventory numbers were pretty strong contributing to that number. All of that makes us go, okay, our read initially was that we can look through that strength. We see the economy slowing. We still think the economy will slow next year, but We've been in the camp for a long time that the Fed is going to be able to get inflation down without causing an outright recession, so more slowing to go on. Inflation continuing to coming down, and there, I think I agree with uh, Rafael Bostic, who you mentioned. I think the collective Fed forecast for how fast inflation is coming down, mm -hmm. too pessimistic. It'll come down faster. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for the Fed to take their first tentative rate cut in June of next year on the back of continuing uh, falling inflation and some more softening of the real economy. And when you say says slowing next year is what you're looking for, quantify that for us. So call it something like one and a half percent, right? So slower than what you'd like to see, almost surely slower than the, the long run potential output of the economy, but not a disaster. And I think that's the real difference. If we go back six months, a year ago, a year and a half ago, the debate was hard landing versus soft landing. We stuck our necks out back in February of 2022 and we said soft landing, no recession. And that was not the most popular view of all time. And here we are, we're feeling pretty good about it. We think there is still some more slowing to go, but we think we are not going to have a recession. At the same time, as you wrote in this outlook, there's still a long road ahead when it comes to inflation coming back to normal, right? Whatever normal means, I guess, are we talking 2% sort of Absolutely. globally? I, mean, I, I personally take Jay Powell at his word that they are committed to their 2% inflation target. They also, you know, have that new framework where there may be during an expansion a little bit above two, so two one, but we don't think we're in a new world where inflation is three percent or four percent forever. It's coming down. We think it probably gets to inflation in the US core inflation two, four at the end of next year and two one at the end of twenty five. So really pretty good progress towards their target. But it is gonna take a while, and that's true not just for the US, but globally as well for inflation to come back down to a more normal level and for rates to come back down to a more normal level. Absolutely. From from start to finish, I guess. <clears throat> no, I, I, th I think no question there. And I have to say one thing that is just different. If you look at the decade before COVID, the US, Europe, you know, the developed market economies were sort of mired in this low interest rate, low inflation world. I think that sort of truly sort of muddling world is probably over where the, the central banks are going to get back to their their inflation target. I mean, I think it was remarkable that just three or four years ago, their biggest concern was that inflation was too low. Now it's too high, but it'll come back, but it will, won't go back to those lows that they worried about. I think that's true in the US. I think that's true in the Euro area. I think perhaps the untold story so far, though, that I think lots of investors need to pay a lot more attention to is Japan. Over two decades, really boring, really mired in sort of zero nominal growth. Those days are behind us. We think there is a fundamental structural shift there in Japan. Inflation has got up. Some of it imported, some of it imported from commodities, so that part's not sustainable. But there is a real change in the underlying dynamic of inflation in Japan. You can see it in the wage negotiations. You can see it in what's going on with uh, producer prices. Uh, we think Japan really has turned the corner and has closed the door on those sort of lost decades of no growth. So that's, it's an interesting take, Seth, on Japan. Also want to get your take on China, though. You know, there was There was a lot of hope that there would be this sort of post-COVID boom over there and said it's kind of shaky. What, what's your outlook for China next year? And I'm also interested, you know, do you think authorities have taken the right steps there or are there other levers they should have been pulling? So it's challenging. If we were having this conversation one year ago, we would have been among those people who you said were kind of optimistic and looking for the post-COVID boom. And we got it in the first quarter and then it fizzled. <clears throat> There is the very clear risk of a debt deflation cycle, sort of what Japan had had back in the 
uh, in the 90s. A uh, lot of debt, we've seen inflation coming down, going negative, uh, lack of confidence with businesses and households. And so what is it going to take? Uh, it probably will take more stimulative fiscal policy to get them out of there. The PBOC has taken a few steps to ease rates, to add some liquidity. That's not where the problem is. The problem is willingness and enthusiasm to spend, and it probably will take some, some action. Uh, have the authorities done the right thing? Uh, I don't think we've seen enough yet. We think there still needs to be more in the way of fiscal policy. They have lots of goals about energy transition, green energy infrastructure spending, and I think that kind of additional spending could give them enough of a boost to get a bit of a cyclical reflation. But we really are at a crossroads now, and it's going to be decision-making coming out of Beijing that's determinative. And then what effect does that have on the rest of the globe? Do you see China exporting deflation, for example, and that's one of the things that helps bring inflation down? But does it end up being negative in the long term? <laughs> so I think there probably is a little bit of that. We've seen a little bit of weakness um, from the currency. Uh, I, and, uh, you know, oil prices have been moving back and forth in different ways. But there's, um, you know, I don't think that's going to be the primary channel. So maybe a little bit of exporting of, of deflation. But remember, right now, we've got central banks tightening policy, trying to pull things down. And the amount of spillover from China in inflation is probably going to get lost there. Where I would point to, though, is Europe and Germany in particular. German manufacturing is really in a tough spot. Their energy prices are going all over the, you know, very volatile and higher than they have been. And they have for a long time relied on exports to China to keep that sector afloat. And that's just not there. So I think that's probably one of the bigger spillovers. And Seth, I want to get you out of here on this as a subject, you know, we talk a lot about here. Our viewers care a lot about the U.S. housing market. Where are we now, Seth? What do you see in 2024? <laughs> Um, we are sort of in this, the housing market is in a really funny place. So if you look at housing activity measured by total home sales, still depressed. If you look at housing affordability, one of the worst places we've been literally since the data have been collected. Um, but part of what's going on is anybody who is in their home right now and owns it probably has a mortgage rate that is so good they don't want to move unless they absolutely have to. And so it's a really thin market. New home sales is a share of total home sales, really high, because it's the only game in town. So what happens from here? Well, you know, we do think the Fed's going to start easing rates come June. Uh, the tenures come down, as you all were talking about at the beginning, and that's going to make things a little bit uh, better for mortgages. Uh, but mostly it's going to be a muddle through. And so we see home prices coming off a little bit, but single digits down from, uh, you know, on a 12-month change basis, that's not that much compared to where things were two years ago, where it's been a massive appreciation. So we're mostly in this very tepid, muddle through period for the U.S. housing sector. You're not going to get a ton there until interest rates come down a lot more. Uh, but it's also not going to collapse. Our, our housing uh, team in particular has been pretty adamant that the, the, the weak supply along with the reduced demand are sort of pushing against each other, but you're not going to get a big move in either direction. All right, Seth, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. That was great. Appreciate it. My pleasure.